Welcome to 3ABN's Sabbath School panel. This is lesson number five that we are studying, Horizontal Atonement, the Cross and the Church, an exciting and inspiring study. My name is John Dinsey. It's a blessing for me to be with you during this hour, and I am happy to have part of the 3ABN family with me, and I'd like to introduce them. To my left is Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. I'm excited about this lesson. I have Reconciliation, God's Gift from the Cross. Amen. And we have Sister Shelley Quinn with us. Welcome. I have Tuesday's lesson, Breaking Down the Dividing Wall. Amen. Amen. We have Professor Daniel Perrin. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And there's not one of us who doesn't need Wednesday's lesson, Jesus, Preacher of Peace. Amen. And we have Pastor James Rafferty way at the other side over there. <laughs> Good to be here, Johnny. I have the church, a holy temple. Amen, amen. This is going to be an interesting study. I hope you are ready, that you have something to write with, and we encourage you to record it if you can, to share with others. But before we begin this study, we're going to ask uh, Daniel Perrin, can you lead us in our prayer, please? I'd love to. Your Father in heaven, Lord, as we come once again to the book of Ephesians, we know that it takes us right to the cross of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, where our burdens are taken off of our back and we receive forgiveness, and we receive uh, unity in the church. Lord, I ask that you bring that unity through the church so that your name can be glorified. And in all things, we praise Jesus for what he's done and what he is doing in us. Mm -hmm. Bless us as we study today, we pray in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So let's begin this lesson. It's, a, it's an exciting lesson. I would like to... Uh, I ask you to join me in reading Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Mm. This verse will be discussed during this lesson, but I want to take you back to the time Jesus Christ had passed away and the news of Jesus uh, as being a savior uh, is spreading. And you are a Greek Gentile. You hear about this and you're excited and you understand that he's a living savior in heaven. You before were worshiping idols made out of stone or wood and now you want to worship the living God. Mm. So you start making your way to the temple. But along the way, you see the walls and you see, you start to hear worship and you get interested in joining the people of God worshiping. However, as you make your way, you find a sign such as more or less as is written in the lesson. It says, no foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So how do you feel at that moment? Yeah. Well, you were excited. You were hoping to get in there, but now you feel shut out, alienated, separated. What do you do? You turn around and you go back in sadness. But you see, Christ is the one that breaks down barriers. Although Jews that had accepted Jesus would accept you as a believer, they were struggling with this issue. And you know, even today, some of the Jews... Uh, behave in such a way that it would be shocking. Uh, I've heard stories of Jews that as you're walking on the same side of the sidewalk as they are, they either cross the street, so not to, to see a Gentile face to face. Some of that still remains for those that are not Christians. But I encourage you to consider what Jesus offers you to be a part of God's family here on earth and in heaven as well. I'm reading to you from the lesson. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, Paul sees the cross of Christ as making a dramatic difference, destroying such barriers and walls. Vertically, the cross dissolves alienation, reconciling humans with God. Horizontally, it reconciles people with each other. Yeah. The cross removes enmity and brings peace between Jews and Gentiles, making of them one new humanity. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. And together they become a new temple, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. During this week's lesson, uh, you're going to see and hear, actually hear exciting things, and we hope that you'll be encouraged to continue reading God's Word. We move to Sunday's portion. The title is Brought Near in Christ. 
brought near in Christ. So in this part, we are comparing Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, and also Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The question is, what does, he, uh, what does Paul assent in his fresh description of their past? Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you he made alive, mm. who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Paul is bringing to their attention that they were once alienated, separated from God, but Jesus Christ has made them one. And it is healthy for us to take a, uh, a moment to examine ourselves, to see where the Lord brought us from yes. and rejoice that we are no longer walking in those things of the past. Right. Not to dwell in uh, those horrible things we used to do, but to be thankful to understand that we were, as it says here, uh, separated from God and children of wrath but God rescues us and makes us children of God. And of course, Paul gives recognition that we have an enemy. He is considered uh, the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We live in a world, remember that Ephesians was for the Ephesians, but the book of Ephesians is for us living today. We are living in the world where we face every day children who are children of wrath or people that are uh, people of wrath, that they are, the evil one works through them. And we need to be careful and we need to, by the grace of the Lord, let our light so shine that by our words and our actions, we will get them interested in tasting and seeing that God is good. And so let's go ahead and read now, Ephesians chapter two, verse 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope mm. and without God in the world. That's the past. The present for them was that they had hope. They were part of God's family. They were sons and daughters of God. Uh, and there was an issue back in those days still. The, 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 uh, the Jews who had not uh, given their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, they called the Gentiles uncircumcised. And of course, the Gentiles uh, that were still having issues and dealing, they were, there was still some bickering going back and forth Ephesians is calling people to unity, mm -hmm. calling people to be united in Christ. And today we are to be united in Christ. This is the main focus of the book of Ephesians, lifting up Jesus Christ, letting people know that we are saved by grace, letting people know that the love of God has no, no limits. It has no limits, no breath, no depth. It is without limit and that we all can be family. We all can be one big family in Christ Jesus. I'm reading to you from the lesson. It says, Gentiles who were now believers in Christ and members of his body, the church, were once totally separated from Israel and the salvation God offered. Paul judges it important to remember this past, Ephesians 2, 11. They were then without Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah of Israel. They were aliens from the commonwealth, the state of Israel, the people of Israel and they were strangers from the covenants of promise, oblivious to the promises of salvation, uh, of salvation God had offered down through salvation history. The alienation from Israel and the salvation offered through it meant that they once had no hope and were without God in the world. But all this changes because of Jesus. And I praise the Lord that for you and for me, all of our past, that we children of wrath, we lived in darkness, we can now live in God's marvelous light. Ephesians chapter two, verse 13, it says, but now 
in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off mm -hmm. have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Have you been brought near by the blood of Christ? Don't let the former things that controlled you, don't let those things keep you away from Jesus. Uh, come to Jesus just as you are. He will receive you. Remember uh, that we are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. In this lesson, uh, Dr. McVeigh uh, brings out another thought that I'd like to share with you. It says, Ephesians 2.13, however, however, points to some radically, something radically different now. Paul wrote, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we have peace mm. in Jesus. The wall has been broken down and we become one family. Praise the Lord. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the... Uh, Seventh-day Adventist book, uh, Bible study or Bible commentaries, it says the subject of Ephesians is unity in Christ. And so we ask ourselves, do we need unity in Christ today? The answer is yes. Even now, Satan is trying to divide God's people. Even now, Satan is uh, working in people to bring every wind of doctrine. And we must study God's Word. This is why I'm glad that Three Even has the Sabbath School panel to uh, lead us back to the Bible. And the many programs on 3 and lead you back to the Bible because uh, we're living in dangerous times and we must know what it does say the Lord is. This is an exciting study in the book of Ephesians and we continue now with Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. What a great lesson. I love that foundation. I'm Jill Morricone and on Monday we look at reconciliation, God's gift from the cross. You know, I think it's hard for us to comprehend what it was like for the early Christian church and the enmity, the hatred, the bitterness that existed between the Jews and Gentiles. We can read about it. And when you read that, what uh, the sign there, when you enter the temple or get near to that and you see that mm -hmm. and to recognize, I can't even imagine being a non-Jew during that time and thinking, oh, but Jesus is my Messiah, but I've accepted him, but I want to serve him, but I want to be part of its people and feeling that separation. Even today, God's end time people, there's a separation. Now it might not look the same as Jews and Gentiles, but there are divisions. There are separations. Satan loves to come in and bring disunity and disharmony. So I think this lesson is so vitally important for us. As we look at Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10, we see that vertical um, reconciliation with God. In other words, all of us were dead in trespasses and sins, and all of us need to be reconciled back to God, brought back into right standing. Then we look at the passage we're looking at now, the horizontal reconciliation. Once we're reconciled with God, we are automatically brought back into reconciliation with our brothers and sisters. Today we look specifically at three gifts that the cross brought for believers. We're gonna look at a dual application here, the apostolic times, which of course is the times that Paul wrote it for the Ephesians there, the early Christian church. Then we're also gonna have an end time application or an application for us today and how does it apply to our life? What are the gifts of the cross for believers today? Not just in Bible times, but for us today. Uh, the first gift is that Gentiles who were far off, now we're looking at the apostolic times right now, this is Paul's day. Gentiles who were far off are brought near and made family. Pastor Johnny read that verse, Ephesians 2, 13. Let's read it again. Ephesians 2, 13, and we're gonna combine it with verse 19. But now, I love that. We did that last lesson, this but now, when you see that, the Gentiles were in one place. They were alienated, they were separated. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, this is the Gentiles he's speaking specifically to, have been brought near, why? By the cross, by the blood of Christ. Jump down to verse 19. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. As Pastor Johnny referenced, the Gentiles were not allowed into the inner courts there of the temple. They were excluded from that worship. 
but now they are brought near through the blood of Jesus, through the cross. They're brought near God and his people. We see this horizontal reconciliation taking place. They're made fellow citizens of the church. Gift number two, the enmity or the hatred between the Jews and Gentiles is put to death because of the cross. Or in Ephesians 2, verse 16 and 17, that he might reconcile, this is Jesus, might reconcile them to God in one body. How? Through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. That word enmity in Greek means hatred, mm. hostility. Mm -hmm. Enmity. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. You could say the longstanding hatred between the Jews and Gentiles is put to death. Mm -hmm. The axe is buried. This longstanding feud, we have like the Hatfield and McCoys, right? The longstanding <laughs> feud is put to rest. Remember in John chapter 4, when Jesus visited um, the Samaritan village and the woman was there at the well. And she was surprised, why? That Jesus would speak to her. In fact, she says in verse nine, uh, uh, John four, verse nine, Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This is a longstanding issue. In Galatians chapter two, we find the New Testament church, um, the brethren, Peter eating with the Gentiles. And we see, wow, those barriers are really being broken down. But then when the brethren came down from Jerusalem, the Bible calls it the circumcised. These are the Jewish believers. What did Peter do? Oh no, I'm not gonna eat with the Gentiles. Oh no, that wall is going to come back up. This is a longstanding issue. And yet he had already had this vision in Acts of, for, as far as the gospel going to Cornelius, right? The gospel going to the Gentiles. And yet still old habits die hard. Some of that enmity, yes. some of that animosity rises its ugly head again. In Galatians 3, verse 27 to 29, I love this passage. Paul speaking, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. If you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed, Shelley, and Amen. heirs according to the promise. You see race, ethnicity, background, status, money, position, religion, all of that doesn't matter because all of us can be adopted in Christ Jesus. The cross puts to death that enmity. Gift number three, reconciliation takes place through the cross. You see, we can put aside the feud or put aside the hatred, but we don't just want that. We want reconciliation. We want healing. Verse 16, Ephesians 2, 16, he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, putting to death the enmity. In the place of hostility is now a reconciliation. We're reconciled through the cross. We know we're vertically reconciled to God through the cross. Second Corinthians 5, 18 says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. But now we're also reconciled horizontally to each other through the cross. Unity in the church, unity in the family, unity in society between Jews and Gentiles, husbands and wives, parents and children. All of that comes through Jesus Christ. What about our present day application for here for today? What are the gifts of the cross that we have here? Number one, gift number one, God brings other people into the church and then they are brought near by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Pastor John always says there's no standards for fellowship, standards for membership and high standards for leadership. But oftentimes we put high standards on even fellowship. Mm -hmm. We say, you don't smell like I do. You don't look like I do. You don't dress like I do. You don't eat like I do. Therefore, I'm gonna push you aside, but no. They are to be brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. None of that makes any difference in Christ. Number two, gift number two. Bitterness between members in the church can be put to death through the cross. Bring your unforgiveness to the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been in a church where people walk up different aisles because they don't wanna look at each other? 
They don't want to say happy Sabbath to their brother and sister because there's bitterness, because there's unforgiveness. Matthew 5, uh, Jesus puts it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23. If you bring your gift to the altar and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar, go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Is there bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart toward a brother or a sister? Go to God, go to the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to grant you his forgiveness. The blood of Jesus at the cross can reconcile us as brothers and sisters and break down the bitterness that unfortunately does exist in places in the church. Finally, gift number three, reconciliation can take place through the cross. Unity comes in Christ, not apart from Christ. Mm -hmm. First John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship or koinonia, spiritual fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. What does that mean? If you're walking in the light, that means you're walking in Jesus. You're vertically reconciled to the Father. And your brother or sister in church is also walking in the light and vertically reconciled to God you're automatically gonna be horizontally reconciled to each other. If there's differences, go to each other, ask for forgiveness and know that those barriers can be broken down by the blood of Jesus. Amen, amen. amen. Yes, barriers can be broken down by the blood of Jesus. We will continue in a moment. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Avian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3AVNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. We continue in this Hour of Blessing with Sister Shelley Quinn. Oh, and it is my blessing. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Tuesday's lesson, Breaking Down the Dividing Wall. I hope you have your Bibles open to Ephesians 2, because mm -hmm. we will look closely at the context of what Paul is saying. Paul, in his writings, uses the word the law, the law, the law, quite a bit. Sometimes he's referring to the book of the law, uh, excuse me, to the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Sometimes he's referring to the book of the law, which was Deuteronomy. Sometimes he's referring to the Ten Commandments or to a natural law that kind of controls our flesh. So we're going to look at Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, because he's talking about a law here. We want to make certain we understand which law is he referring to. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he, Jesus himself is our peace, hallelujah, mm -hmm. who has made both one, both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation that you were talking about, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, Jill, that you were talking about. But then get this, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, now he's going to explain what was that enmity. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Mm -hmm. What does he mean, the law contained in ordinances? Some people try to say that Paul teaches that the, the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments weren't contained in ordinances. So let's look at this. Ephesians 2.15, these laws contained in ordinances were unique to the Jewish nation. This is the old covenant that he is speaking of. And when God 
did away with the old covenant and made the new covenant, renewed the covenant, what happened is that horizontal reconciliation, bringing Jew and Gentile together. As Johnny was telling us earlier, in Herod's temple, there was this fence barrier, it was called a balustrade, that was around the court of the Israelites. Gentiles couldn't go in. But what, why couldn't they? The Gentiles did not have, did not operate by the Old Covenant. Do you know what the Old Covenant was? The Old Covenant is recorded actually in Exodus 20 verses 22 to Exodus 23:33. The Old Covenant was civil, social, and ceremonial laws that contained all of these ordinances about food and drink offerings and festivals and annual Sabbath days. Those were uh, feast days that were symbolic of the ministry of Christ. This old covenant that God dictated to Moses was the constitution for the new nation of Israel. And then Moses ratified that with the people. Now, it's interesting because as that group, we, we're working our way through Exodus, they wander for 40 years in the desert. And as they reach the edge of the promised land, first generations died off. It's the second generation. What did God do? He adds and enhances some of these ordinances. And Moses writes them in the book of the law. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy. I want to show you this because it's so important. Moses is adding all of these in the book of the law, God's re additional requirements. Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31 says, uh, we're going to begin with verse 24. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, they were finished. Now, when he first wrote the, the old covenant, it was called the book of the covenant. But now listen, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord saying, take this book of the law. From here forward, it's either called book of the law or book of the covenant. Put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God. What's on the inside of the ark? Ten commandments. The Ten Commandments are in the inside because that's God's charter of rights for his government of love. It's the foundation of his government of love. But Moses is saying, take this book of the law, this old constitution, and all of these ordinances contained in commandments, put it on the side of the ark of the, your, your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. What? What do you mean as a witness against us? Well, because... God's giving all of this to Moses. And then afterwards he says, yeah, I already know what they're going to do. They're going to serve pagan gods. They're going to sin against me. So he gives Moses all of these curses that are included in this book of the law that, I mean, there's blessings if you obey, but there's curses for disobedience. It was put on the side of the ark as a temporary placement and it was a witness against them. So now... What happened to that? What was nailed to the cross? I want to give you three things that I see that was nailed to the cross. In 1 Peter 2.24, the Bible says that Christ bore our sins in his body. He paid our sin debt at the cross. There's no doubt the, any certificate of indebtedness of, of, against us for sin was nailed to the cross. His precious blood blotted that out. Romans 6, 6 tells us that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of a sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So this old fallen human nature was nailed to the cross. But what else was nailed to the cross? The old covenant book of the law was nailed to the cross. 
we looked how Paul said in Ephesians 2, 13, these ordinances are abolished at the cross, but now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both one. He has broken down the middle wall of separation. No more distinction between Jew and Gentile. All these unique Jewish things nailed to the cross. Having abolished the law of commandments that is in ordinance. In ordinances. See, when Christ ratified the new covenant, it's a renewal of the everlasting covenant. The covenant promises that the Gentiles couldn't take place in actually were given to the patriarchs before there was ever a Jew. It was righteousness by faith, salvation by grace. And they didn't understand this. But what happens? Let me turn to Colossians 2. We've got to get this in. Colossians 2, 14 through 17 says, he's talking about at the cross, that Christ having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Mm -hmm. What stood against them? Not only their record of sins, but that old covenant that had all those curses for sin was there to stand as a witness against them. He said he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, here's your purpose statement. Therefore, let no one judge you, since these things have been nailed to the cross. Get this context. Let no one judge you in food or in drink. He's talking about the ordinances of food and drink offerings, or regarding a festival or, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. He's talking about the annual Sabbaths the annual feast days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance was Christ. Mm -hmm. The old covenant pointed to the coming Messiah. When the Messiah arrived, he nailed that old covenant along with our sins, along with our sinful fallen human nature to the cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Shelley. I heard the word covenant over and over again, and I also heard the word cross Amen. over and over again. The two things that uh, unite us, bring us together with God and with each other. Uh, I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Wednesday's lesson, Jesus, Preacher of Peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do see the cross for the first time in words there in Ephesians 2.16, the word cross. Paul hadn't mentioned it before, but it had been there all along, blood, redemption, purchased, grace, salvation. But he now says explicitly, it's through the cross and that leads to action, it, which is in verse 17, Ephesians 2, 17 and 18. And he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. There are a lot of wars going on. Conflicts in homes, conflicts in marriages, conflicts in churches between brothers and sisters in Christ. And you might be involved in one of those conflicts right now. Mm -hmm. My wife and I went to a restaurant the other day and, and talked a little bit in the parking lot. And when we opened our doors, we heard the sound of yelling uh, and swearing from a, an adult mother, a mother to her back and forth with her adult child. Mm -hmm. It was just so destructive, so unpeaceful. We went into the restaurant and a few minutes later, both of them came in and ate and another person came in and we prayed for them from our own table because you could just sense the conflict between the two of them. Jesus did not say that we would not be a part of conflict. In fact, he said that we would. Uh, I love in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers mm -hmm. for they will be called the sons of God. And, and where are you when you're making peace? You could do it from the side, but most often you've got to get right in the conflict. Mm. And that's one of the paradoxes of the Bible is that we can have peace in the midst of conflicts and, and differences and personalities that, that are not identical. And that's what Jesus did. That's how he preached, not from an exalted pulpit, but he came down in the midst 
of the pews and the gutters and the conflicts, and he preached. That word preached is evangelize, to draw people in. And it's illustrated here in verse 17. He came and preached, or 18, for through him, Jesus, we both have access by one spirit mm -hmm. to the Father mm -hmm. in the Godhead, perfect unity, illustrated for us, to be lived out by us. And what did he preach? He preached peace. Well, verse 14 tells us he himself is our peace. So he preached himself. He preached himself. If somebody spends a lot of time talking about themselves, you might get kind of tired of it mm. and think, wow, that's a lot of vanity, mm. a lot of selfishness. He's always talking about himself, but not so, not vanity with Jesus because mm. we need peace and he is our peace. He doesn't just give us peace or bring us peace, but he is that Amen. peace. In 1962, some of you may know this story, Don Richardson went as a missionary to Indonesia with his wife and seven month old child to the Sawi tribe. And uh, they were a tribe that was known for treachery. Nobody wanted to go there and he felt God calling him. And uh, as he worked with this tribe and told them the story of Jesus, here's a, a group of people who valued treachery and deception is their highest virtue and ideal. And so he tells the story of Jesus. And when he got to Judas, who got into the inner circle and through a kiss betrayed him, oh, they thought this was the hero. So tell us more about Judas, a man I'd be proud to give my daughter in marriage to. There's no way that the gospel can come through to this people. And to make matters worse, these tribes that were warring were now coming closer to be nearer to him. And, and wars were battles being fought in front of his house daily and people uh, being, being killed on occasion and, uh, you know, bloodied. And he said, I can't stay here any longer. He told them, if you can't make peace, I'm going to leave. We don't want you to leave. So the next day they said, uh, Don, we'll, we'll make peace. And so they brought him and the two tribes faced off in front of each other. And he thought, oh no, they're gonna do something. And sure enough, one of the men of one tribe took the baby out of the arms of his wife, a six month old baby, his only son. And he went running across the field and delivered the baby into the hands of the opposing tribe, the chief. And Don Richardson thought, oh no, they're gonna sacrifice a child. No, no, just watch, just watch, they said. And all the men of the tribes came and put their hands on that baby and said, this is the peace child mm -hmm. that, is, that we now will have peace. Mm -hmm. See, they said, as long as this child is living, they gave their child to this tribe. And as long as that child is alive, there will be peace. Mm -hmm. And then he realized here is, here is something that God has preserved in this culture, the seeds of the gospel to be able to illustrate to them what God wants to do with us. And he said, Jesus himself was God's peace child who came down with us. What? And Judas betrayed a peace child? Oh, how could he? Mm. And all of a sudden, this was a door opening that uh, they could see and we can see illustrated. God doesn't only give us peace, he gives himself. Amen. And that presence of Jesus then reconciles us to God and creates reconciliation for each other. And sure enough, these, these two tribes lived together peacefully after that. And this is why Isaiah says in chapter nine, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. peace. And the angels say glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, all right? Specifically, how does he do that? Through the cross. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at a cross, it doesn't look peaceful. Mm. It looks violent mm. and destructive and bloody. And yet to say this here, what, what he did, what he went through brings peace between us and then between each other. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus lived it out. He didn't just speak it in words. He lived it out and he invites us to do the same thing. He brought Samaritans and Jews together. He brought men and women together. And I love Acts 2, where people say, we all, you're preaching the gospel and we all hear it mm -hmm. in our own language, in the same place, the same gospel message. Verse 18 says, for through him, we both have access. Access is to approach. 
It's to have the way opened, all on the same basis of sinfulness. None of us can claim no sin and all on the same terms of forgiveness. One salvation, one moral code, one access. And I, I think it was already said, I think, uh, Jill, you might have said it, but we've all got to go down the same aisle. Mm. And I love this, this access. We've all got to go to the one cross. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you've thought that I'll, I'll wait till they go in first and then, then I'll go in after them. No, we've all got to be united. Mm -hmm. One cross, one approach, equal opportunity faith, no caste system, no segregation, no tiers of membership or seclusion, because those things all indicate that we're comparing ourselves Amen. with each other. Well, she's uh, more of this than I am, and he's less of that than I am. And so when Jesus preaches himself, the reason is, is because we stop looking at ourselves and each other, and we start looking at him. Mm -hmm. And we all realize we're united, united on the same basis. And so this then becomes a call to you and to me to check our attitudes. Mm. Do we have barriers that we're erecting mm. in the way that we're thinking about people or that we're exalting ourselves? Barriers in the church or in our families. Has Jesus brought peace to you? And one of the tragedies in the Christian church is that there is so little peace. And especially when we have these promises, Isaiah 26, verse 3, mm. you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you in the cross. And that perfect peace is not just a feeling of tranquility. It's referring to this concept as well of uniting us in what Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119 verse 165, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Jesus in John 14, 27, peace I live you, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not the peace that the world gives. In Romans 5, verse 1, I, I have to say it. I love this verse. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the, the vertical version. No longer at conflict with God. We're going in the same direction. He and I both agree that I'm a sinner and I can't help myself and he's the only help. We're in agreement on that. There's peace now with God. And the function of peace then and preaching peace is that he invites us to be a part of that. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And we hear the word one more time, proclaiming peace brings glad tidings. And so we're to live this out. And I know, I know Jill already mentioned this. It's in my notes and I want to say it one more time because one of you is needing to hear this who's watching. If you're bringing your gift to the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. If God's putting that on your heart right now, go and do that today. Ask God, how can I say those words? How can you bring the reconciliation you've already brought to me between me and my brother or sister in Christ? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Johnny. Beautiful, beautiful lesson here that we have. I've, I'm looking at verses 19 through 22. My name is James Rafferty and I have Thursday's lesson which is entitled, The Church, A Holy Temple. Verses 19 through 22, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. There's no more sign that says you can't enter here, right? There's, there's reconciliation, the, 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 the enmity has been taken out of the way. We're all going down that same aisle. We're all fellowshipping together. We have peace in Jesus Christ. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom we also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. How did we get, how do we get from a temple that Gentiles can't enter to a building that they're now part of? Amen. That not only can they enter this building, they're part of the building. Jesus is the chief cornerstone and they're part of the building. And this analogy is not used by Paul in Ephesians only. He uses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This the quarterly brings out. He uses it also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Again and again and again, he talks about that the body of Christ that is Jews and Gentiles that are making up a holy temple. Now, you have to think about this a little bit because the temple at large, the one in Jerusalem, was still standing per perhaps when Paul wrote this. It wasn't destroyed until 70 AD, and we know that Paul lived at least into the 60s. So, so Paul's writing these words, and 
the Jews that have become Christians and even the Gentiles that have become Christians are well aware that there's this building that was ordained of God in the Old Testament that they cannot enter even to that time. And some of the converted Jews are kind of trying to bring some of those restrictions into the church. How do you deal with this? How do we process this? How do we understand this? Well, John, um, you talked about, you know, putting yourself in the place of a Gentile. You know, you believe in Christ, you go to the temple and you want to worship God, but there's this sign. And I thought it might be good for us to put ourselves in the place of a Jew, going all the way back to the beginning when God uh, assigned them this symbolism of the sanctuary. And he told them, now these are the parameters, you know, only the Levites can touch the ark. Uzzah, you can't touch that ark. And only the priests can go in there and sacrifice. Kings, you can't go in there and sacrifice. And you have to take the fire from off the altar, Nahab and, and Abihu. You can't be taking that strange fire. Uh, we've got parameters here. You've got to take your shoes off. We don't want any dust. God is holy. Yeah. God is holy. Yeah. And these parameters here are put up. We don't even want the Gentiles helping to build to reconstruct the temple after their captivity. No, the, the, excuse me, the Gentiles, the Samaritans can't help. You may believe in God, but you've got some compromise taking place. You can't be part of this. And then Jesus comes and he's talking to a Samaritan woman. Like, why is he breaking down? It took us hundreds of years to finally get to the place where we're not going to compromise. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to let anyone in this temple. We're not going to enter marriage. We're not going to, we're going to make sure we keep all of these laws, all of these ordinances. We're going to make sure we keep them perfectly. And then a guy claiming to be the Messiah comes and he starts breaking down all these. He's going to, he's going to get us to start compromising with the Gentiles again. He's got to be stopped. He's got to be stopped. Mm -hmm. At all costs, he's got to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And how did we, how do we transition? What we recognize, what we realize, as you brought out, Shelley, is that all of these ordinances and all of these laws that were set up regarding worship and approaching God in the temple, all of them pointed to Jesus. Amen. All of them are fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus comes and he becomes the perfect fulfillment of yeah. everything that was needed to approach God. Everything that was needed to approach God, Jesus now has fulfilled all of that and he hands that to anyone who will believe in him. If you want to approach God, you just need me. And when you have me, you can come directly to the Father. Amen. I am the holiness that was required in that temple. I am the, the, the sacrifice without blemish that was required to approach that temple. I am everything that was needed, the purification that was needed to approach God and I am what you need to be reconciled with God. This is the point that Paul is making here in Ephesians 2, and he also makes it again in other portions of the scripture. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians, we have a church that is sanctified, that is called in Christ. And I mean, Paul just, just announces this as he introduces. Let's just look at the verses here in 1 Corinthians because they're very powerful when you contrast them with the condition of the church itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God uh, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, verse 2, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints, and all in every place that call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to tell them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you guys are carnal. You're carnal. You guys are fighting over the, the food at the Lord's Supper and you're taking each other to, to court and you, you've got sexual immorality among you. It's not even mentioned among the Gentiles. And if in the, in the Jewish mind, going back to pre-cross, in the Jewish mind, these people are not worthy to come to the temple. Mm. These people cannot even approach God in any way, shape or form. But in the gospel, Paul says, you have standing in Christ and God in Christ is going to allow you to approach him. But in Christ means that you need to listen to what I have to tell you, because people that are in Christ don't live the way you're living. You're called to be in Christ and this is the way you should be living. You should not be following people. You should not be following Apollos or, Cephas, Apollos or Cephas or Paul and saying, you know, that you're You should be following Christ because he goes on to say here, Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
Verse 11, Christ is the foundation, verse 10, and there's no other foundation that can be laid but that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, the temple can only be built upon the foundation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The temple can only be built in the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And the only way we can be part of that temple in our less than sanctified, less than perfect condition is if we come in Christ because in Christ we have the holiness and the purity. In Christ we have fulfillment of all those ordinances that restricted us from access to the temple if we were a Gentile and even caused us to, at, at times, to die because we, we violated those pro prohibitions. We violated those principles and those ordinances that taught us how to approach God. But in Christ we have life. In Christ we're quickened. In Christ we're made alive because Christ has fulfilled all of that purity and holiness. And when we cling to Him, we have the covering of Jesus Christ, Amen. which does not uh, cover us so that we can keep on sinning and keep on being in transgression to God and keep idly worshiping idols. And so when Paul brings this house in 1 Corinthians, oh, he just, he just goes through. He becomes the true witness. Jesus Christ becomes the true witness, right? He becomes the true witness. And as a true witness, he does what the law once did. He points out our need for him. He points out where we're failing. He, in love, because, because the Lord says, as many as I love are rebuke and chasten, in love, He brings out the need we have to, to, to be reconciled to God in every aspect of our lives. Every particle of dust is going to be removed from our feet through Jesus Christ. But at the same time, He covers us so that we can approach God, so that we can, so that we can have that place in this holy temple, in this temple that is, that is the very habitation of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, then 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and then 1 Peter chapter 2. All of those verses uh, describe this temple building as the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, and all of them connect that temple to Jesus. There's no way we can be part of that temple. There's no way we can approach that temple without Jesus Christ. And that's really the point that Paul is making here in Ephesians chapter 2, that Jesus Christ is the way that we come. And by the way, Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 and 10, the city is the bride of Christ, Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. The city gates are named after the 12 tribes, Revelation 21, 14. The city foundations are named after the 12 apostles, uh, John 14, 1 through 3. The city has a place for every one of us. That city is a representation of God's people. God's people are the bride of Christ. That city is a representation of all those who are in Christ, all of those who have access to Jesus Christ, who is the foundation, who is the chief cornerstone. And that city includes both Jews and Gentiles. Those who refuse the blood of Christ are outside the city. They're not part of the city. But those who want to be part of that city don't have to go now through a sign. They don't have to be excluded because of certain uh, barriers that have been set up, certain uh, prohibitions that have been established by Christ because Jesus Christ has taken all of those down in Himself. And now the only requirement, the only way and the truth and the light to get life, to get into the city is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ becomes the foundation by which we have access to the Father. And Jesus Christ uh, longs for us to have that access through him, not only us, but every single person who would believe to have that access to the Father through him. Friends, we're just, we're pleading with you as we look at this lesson, we're, we're uh, pleading with you, go to Christ. Don't allow any of those artificial barriers in your own life, your own guilt, your own sin to inhibit you from coming directly to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, we have a few moments to share final thoughts you may have. We start with Sister Jill Mariconi. What an incredible lesson. I've been so blessed by this. On Monday, we looked at reconciliation, which is God's gift from the cross. I want to read again a verse that probably almost all of us have read, but this is Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you come <clears throat> from. God says in Christ Jesus at the foot of the cross, we're all made one. What an incredible gift we have in Jesus. Amen. My mind is going in a thousand directions right now, but uh, Tuesday's lesson was breaking down the dividing wall. Let me ask you, what is walling you off from the Lord? 
Do you ever feel like you've hit the wall and you can't go beyond it? If you will go to Jesus, I love the, the uh, scripture from 1 Corinthians 1.30 that it says, you are in Christ who, Christ, has become our wisdom from God, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. If you feel that you can't approach God, just go say, Lord, show me what this wall is and bring down that dividing wall. He will. He wants to live in your heart. He wants your heart. Amen. Wednesday's lesson lifted up Jesus again as preacher of peace. And you might say to yourself, I'm not a preacher. I could never preach. But I've talked to all sorts of people who say this, that they came to Christ. Sure, they heard the words that someone said, but uh, it wasn't until they saw it lived out. They saw the way someone treated people. Mm -hmm. They saw the way they treated them when, when they gave them a hard time. And that's what gave them the picture, uh, the real picture of what Christianity and the love of Jesus is all about. And that's what Jesus did. He didn't just speak, but his words give life. Mm -hmm. But he lived out the peace that he offers to you and to me. Amen. 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 Friends, read these words again with new eyes. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And he came, Christ came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them which were nigh. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Hallelujah. It is through Jesus Christ that we have access to the Father because he is our purity, our holiness, our righteousness. And we, each one of us, can come to the Father through Jesus Christ. Let that be your experience, friends. Amen, amen. Thank you, each and every one of you. This has been a wonderful, marvelous study, and we hope that you have been encouraged and drawn to the Lord. And I want to remind you as we finish, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. If you find yourself dead in trespasses and sins, if you find yourself that you, you think you have no hope, there is hope in Jesus. He is able to draw you near. And today, the door of mercy is still open. We encourage you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will take all those uh, sins and all of those wicked things away with His blood. By His blood, you are drawn near. Mm -hmm. We encourage you to do that. Uh, this is a, a study that will continue next week. We are continuing in the book of Ephesians and it will be number six, lesson number six, the mystery of the gospel. We hope to see you then.